Hello. So thanks very much for that introduction, and thanks very much to all of you for being here today. So my lab at Cold Spring Harbor, just, I don't know, an hour down the road or so from here, uh, we're, in my lab, we're, we're at the highest level, we're, we're very interested in the structure and function of genomes. And this, is, this can be really basic questions as to what is the sequence? Uh, if you look across the population, what do we see in terms of variability there, in terms of mutations? Uh, we're also interested in some of the applications, um, you know, not looking at genomes per se, but looking at some of the sort of other biochemical activity. You know, number one would be RNA-seq data, methylation, uh, chip-seq to look at how the, the, the proteins are binding to DNA and so forth. Uh, today, though, they asked me, you know, can you, can you really come out and give a talk about some of the latest biotechnologies and talk really about the algorithms associated with them? So I'm going to focus on kind of two main uh, research areas, one of single cell biology, specifically looking at uh, genomic changes, specifically looking at copy number changes uh, at a single cell re resolution, and then the number two te uh, technology I'm going to talk about a single molecule technology. So this is the ability to go in and take a single molecule, in this case of DNA, read off its sequence that has some really unique properties and also some really unique challenges that we need to overcome to make sense of it. Uh, like I said, so my lab is very interested in, in, the, in the structure and function of genomes. Just, just to clarify one thing, when I say structure, primarily I'm talking about, I was told not to use the laser. Primarily, we're interested in the, in the sort of sequence composition. So the nucleotides of DNA, the nucleotides of RNA, so forth. Occasionally, we're very interested in the actual you know, biophysical structure of the molecules, especially if we're thinking about things like splicing or, or the way the DNA is going to fold to form chromatin and so forth, but primarily the sequences. Uh, in, my, in my lab, in my, in my research, we, we kind of apply this into two major sort of research areas, the first being human genetics. So last year, uh, myself at, and others at Cold Spring Harbor uh, did a quite, a, quite a lot of research into autism genetics, look, in particular looking at the role of de, de novo mutations in those disorders. Uh, kind of the number two uh, biological area that we focus in on is plant uh, biology. So this is uh, things like uh, uh, sequencing important uh, lines uh, of, of, of important species like rice or corn or wheat or so forth to try to look at the variability there and then try to understand, well, why is it that some lines of corn, you know, grow better in some conditions rather than other conditions? In order to achieve these goals, we apply, you know, a variety of different techniques. Kind of number one, as we pointed out, I'm a computer scientist by training. So we think a lot about in terms of the algorithms. We think about, you know, how can we very carefully measure mutations? How can we very carefully measure expressions? And then because of the huge amount of data being produced, we're also very interested in sort of large-scale computing technologies, been very active with technologies like Hadoop, cloud computing, GPUs, other things. Really, though, the focus of today's talk is going to be, like I said, at, at the sort of talking about single cell, single molecule analysis about some of the opportunities, some of the challenges associated with that. Uh, and, and just a little more detail, in, so the, it's an hour long talk. It's, it's pretty much going to be broken into two half hour long talks just to kind of give some structure to the overall uh, theme. So the first half, we're going to talk about single molecule sequencing. In particular, I'm going to talk about uh, using that technology to sequence human genomes, uh, breast cancer cell line, and then also uh, number, just give a couple of little uh, vignettes about some other species that we'll be looking at, ranging across the tree of life, from the smallest microbes up through kind of smaller eukaryotes to model systems up to, up to human. And then the second half of the talk, we're going to flip gears and talk about some of the single cell copy number analysis. Uh, we're going to focus mostly on cancer, so looking at the heterogeneity inside of, say, a tumor. Uh, and then look at some of how we can use these technologies to track the progression of, of a disease as it goes through um, metastasis. So I, I think everyone in the room, I, I wasn't entirely sure what the makeup with the, of the audience would be. So I apologize in advance if this is too basic, uh, but I try to hit uh, uh, a starting point just to establish some, some common language. So as I'm sure everyone in the room is, is at least conceptually aware of the sort of the process for sequencing a genome goes something like this. So we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna find our sample of interest uh, and then we're going to, you know, we're going to extract cells, we're going to uh, lyse the cells, extract the DNA, prepare some sort of library. Uh, that library will then be sequenced on any number of different uh, technologies. And then, and, then the whole and then kind of the whole motivation behind uh, genome assembly is to look what are, for, at what are called overlaps. So an overlap is where the end of one sequence matches the beginning of the next. And if we just look at chains of such overlaps, we can build out from one sequence to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. As I often tell my students, it's, it's conceptually very much like if you have uh, you know, those Lego pieces that are just have the four little bricks. If I get enough of these little Lego pieces, I could build a bridge across you know, the Long Island Sound or across the ocean. There's no inherent limitation to how far I can chain these together, assuming, of course, that I can figure out how these Lego bricks or how these reeds lock together. So even though the reeds that we have are much smaller than the genomes we're interested in sequencing, in theory, we should be able to link these together, uh, reconstruct it all. 
So here we have, you know, here I have a set of reads where, I, where, we ha where we, we, in some way we've determined these overlap relationships. They're all sort of linked together very nicely. And then hopefully we'll be able to reconstruct, you know, hopefully the original uh, genome put it back together again. If you're interested in like the very sort of uh, theoretical uh, formulations of this problem, uh, Mr. Giuseppe, myself, and some others, we wrote a nice paper last year where we sort of captured all of the uh, uh, all, the, all the formalisms for the problem. We also point out how all the formalisms that are widely used today all have like really uh, glaring flaws. That if you try to match the data to the formalisms, there's, there's some trivial um, uh, examples where it just breaks down. So, so a lot, at the end of the day, a lot of it is going to be based around heuristics. And that's because in, in some sense this problem is, is trying to solve one of these NP-complete hard problems um, in computer science. So you, you, there's just no way to solve it exactly, so we're going we're gonna to end up using uh, different heuristics based on a lot of them based on these overlap concepts. So the, the number one challenge in, in genome assembly is, so in, so in that previous example, everything to get, locked together really nicely, but the, the, the number one challenge in genome assembly in, in real genomes is that their sequence composition has a lot of structure to this. And in, in particular, what, what I mean by that is that if you look at any real genome of, of, any, of any sort of size, there are going to be certain elements that are going to be repeated in some way. Uh, this can be things like transposable elements that are jumped around the, the genome. This could be perhaps gene families where there's many copies of very similar sequences uh, distributed throughout the genome. Any number of reasons there's going to be some structure to it where you're not just going to have a random distribution of ACGT, there's going to be features along there. So here I have a very simple genome, a cartoon version of a genome where I have sort of just in colored blocks, you know, I have this repetitive sequence color in red. Here it's just a couple copies with unique sequences flanking this label A, B, C, D, uh, and so forth. So if we imagine that there, you know, we were going to go through the shotgun sequencing process, we're going to take this genome and then we're going to split it up into some sort of short reads, right? This will be the true, if you can imagine, the true layout of where these reads are supposed to be. Uh, from the point of view of the genome assemblers, though, as they're looking at the overlaps between all these reads, in any one of these blocks, you know, any one of the, say, you know, the unique blocks like A, B, C, D, and so forth, it's going to be able to figure out more or less how all of those sequences should be locked together. The challenge is going to be, though, as you go from one unique sequence into the repeat and then back into the unique sequence, there's going to be ambiguity, right? They're just not sure from the point of view of the assembler where all that connectivity is lost. From the point of view of the assembler, we're just going to form some sort of graph structure about, well, it'll know, oh, from A it goes into the repeat, but we're just not sure. We don't have enough information to resolve how we should walk out of this repeat. So consequently, when we sequence genomes with short reads, inevitably you don't actually get the full genome back, you don't get the full chromosomes back, you're going to get some sort of distribution of small uh, pieces that have been assembled together. These are called contigs. Uh, so you may think, oh, well, this isn't so bad, this is a simple graph, you know, you can just explore a couple versions of it. On the, on the left here, on this little picture, I, I have a real genome assembly graph, actually of a very small microbe, like it's like the smallest example that would fit on, on one slide. The graphs that we're going to form are actually very complicated. It's not just these little simple motifs. It's going to be, if, I'm sure everyone has seen one of those biological graphs where it's one of these hairballs. That should actually be your mental model when you think about it, the genome assembly graph. It's going to be one of these hairballs. Everything's going to be tightly linked together. In the case of one of these real simple graphs, where we just, I call this like a cloverleaf graph, there's exactly two ways through it. We're going to visit each node. Um, uh, once. But as you start thinking about having a clover leaf and then maybe another clover leaf off of this, and then another clover leaf off of this, another clover leaf, very, very quickly you're going to have a, a, a combinatorial problem. We're going to hit this explosion of possible paths through this graph uh, such that, you know, it's going to be one of these astronomical number of, of possible tours. So just, just trying to list all the, all the possible genome assemblies is, is going to be an intractable problem. Never, never, never mind like, trying to figure out which one is correct. It's just, uh, it's just too big of a search base there. Uh, very formally, uh, if you want to think about the number of ways uh, uh, to search through one of these graphs, it's going to be, uh, 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 it's going to be dependent on the factorial of the, oh, excuse me, the product of the factorial of the degrees of the nodes in the graph. So it's going to grow very, very fast. And then there's various uh, um, layouts through there. So what do we do, right? So what do we do? We want to put together genomes for all these important reasons, to be able to study their gene content, be able to uh, look at regulatory sequences, establish references, be able to do chip seek and all these other assays. So what do we do to actually get really good genome assemblies? Well, the problem is, is that the short reads lack the connectivity that we need to be able to resolve these graphs. So it's, it's kind of no surprise that, you know, if, if at all possible, the number one solution to this challenge is, well, let's try to generate additional data types that are longer. So this can be longer reads, this can be may pairs. 
Uh, this could be uh, strategies to localize the assembly problem, like going back to the back by back technology and so forth. So if we have any, you know, any number one of these, any of these sorts of long read sort of uh, connectivity uh, 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 methods, technologies, uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to use that information to be able to, to, to sort of resolve this graph. Uh, critically important, what we need is that the, the lengths of these new long read sequences are longer than the repeats that are confusing the assembly graph. So in this case, we have some reads that say start from B, jump over to C, so we can overlay that type of information inside of the graph, and then hopefully, aha, we can resolve the track sequence and then be able to put together uh, the full genome, hopefully back into one chromosome. Now it should be clear, though. You know, the, the, you know, if 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 I had my you know if I had my wish, tomorrow, I would wake up tomorrow and there'd be a technology that could just read off whole chromosomes. Assembly problem would be solved. But we're we're a long way away from where the, that technology exists. So inevitably, there's going to be you know a distribution of repeat lengths. Many of them, most actually most of which will be short. Uh, some of them will be sort of medium length, and then there's going to be this long tail where there'll be a few repeats that are just very very long. So inevitably, even if we apply sort of increasing uh, read links to the problem, the technologies that exist today just aren't quite long enough to be able to put together, say, whole human genomes. Instead, as you, as you run an assembly problem, you're going you're gonna to get not just one big long sequence, you're going to get a distribution of, of sequences of different lengths. Uh, uh, so let me kind of walk through an example of what might happen. So let's imagine we have, say, a one megabase per genome, a thousand kilobases. You know, some of these uh, assembled sequences are going to be very big. Some of them are going to be sort of medium size. It, it, in real genome assembly problems, inevitably there's going to be this long tail where you get many, 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 many short contig output. These all tend to be in very high complexity or hi highly repetitive sequences where the assembler is like, oh, I, I see that there's you know some relationships here, but I'm not sure about how they should be reported. So I'm just going to output these teeny tiny little contigs. So this distribution, so this is a very, so this is sort of a, a canonical distribution of the types of the, uh, sequences you're going to put together. You can imagine many different ways to try to summarize this. You could take the median of the distribution, the median of the distribution. The problem is, is because there's so many of these little teeny tiny little contigs, that'll, that'll tend to dominate most summary statistics that are commonly used. So as a result of this, uh, for a long time, going back uh, probably more than 20 years now, the kind of the summary statistic of choice to describe a genome assembly project is the so-called N50 size. So the N50 size is just a summary statistic, just like a, another way to compute the average. But the definition is, is the N50 size is the size such that half of your genome has been assembled into contigs this size or larger. So it's, it's trivial to compute. We just write them down in sorted order, and we just march through them until we get to the halfway point. So 300 KB doesn't reach halfway. 300 plus 100 does not, does not, does not, does not. Finally, once we get to 30 KB, we're like, aha, we've reached half my, I've, re I've reached across half my genome, so I'm going to report that as my sort of one summary statistic number uh, for the assembly. The thing to keep in mind, though, is that this number is, is in my mind, is, is just a proxy, right? Every genome assembly project has some version of this distribution where you get some very big contigs, then this long tail of short guys. So as a result of that, you know, given this one number in your mind, you can imagine the whole rest of the distribution. You can, you can just, it's like if you know, you know, like the, the, the mean of a, of a Poisson distribution, you know everything about it. If you know uh, the mean of an exponential distribution, you know everything about it. So if you know the N50 size, you kind of know everything about what's going on in this assembly. Consequently, uh, this becomes a really powerful proxy to think about, well, the whole quality of the assembly that we put together. So, Larger N50 size is, is, like, is effectively good in, in every way that you might be interested in. With larger N50 size, you're going to be able to assemble more and more of the genes. You're going to be able to assemble more and more of the genes plus the flanking regulatory elements. You're going to get much better resolution of complicated sequences like transposons. Uh, ultimately, what, we're, what, what a lot of projects are interested in is looking at, say, evolution. And there you need you know, not just isolated genes, but you need to have very large chromosomal regions so you can track the synthesis over the ages. And, and for there, you just need very large N50 sizes. Uh, this has been very much a moving target. Uh, there's, been a, there's been kind of a funny uh, um, pattern to this. So back in sort of the heyday of the Sanger Sequencing Human Genome Project, it was not uncommon to have uh, N50 sizes on the order of hundreds of KB, something like this. Uh, but then as we, ha as we transitioned into, into short read sequencing back with, say, you know, early Illumina sequencing, it was not uncommon to have you know, published genomes, but where the contig ended to 50 size was like 1 KB. There was a lot of uh, uh, very carefully worded papers saying, well, you know, we have exon size resolution to our assembly. It was just like, you know, it was, it was a very dark era for genomics. 
I anticipate we're going to go back to a lot of those assemblies and like, you know, basically throw them, throw them away and start over now that we have you know, all these new, more, much more powerful technologies. Okay, and then, oh, and then finally, you know, as, as we move into the modern era, we've, we've kind of moved from pretty nice reference quality assemblies down to, you know, basically through the paper shredder. Now we're kind of climbing back out of that dark hole and, and getting better and better assemblies driven by improved biotechnologies. So today, the, the, sort of today, the kind of the, the two technologies that, that produce the longest contiguous reads are, are both single molecule sequencing instruments. On the left, I have a picture of the PacBio RS. This is from the, from the company called Pacific Biosciences. The company's been around for a few years. Uh, I think they launched their sort of first commercial product in 2010. It's easy to remember because that was when I started at Cold Spring Harbor, and we were like customer number one or two of this thing. So we had, we had very early access to this. Uh, the new kit on the block is on the, on the right here. This is, the Oxford, this is a picture of the Oxford Nanopore Minion. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a very small device. It was just launched sort of quasi-commercially uh, uh, last summer. I say quasi because there, there's this early access program. So you can't actually just go to the store and buy one of these things. You have to enroll in this program, and uh, they'll make these available to a lot of you. The, the number one sort of uh, uh, really interesting property of both of these is, well, it's, is, is, from my point of view, from a sort of a genome structure point of view, is their incredible uh, read lengths. Whereas Illumina sequencing, all of the reads are more or less, I don't know, 100 base pairs or maybe 150 or maybe 250 with some of the new kits. Here we talk about, here we measure the read length distribution in sort of tens of KB. So for both the PacBio and for the Oxford Nanopore, you know, it's not uncommon to have runs where the average read length is, you know, 8 kb, 10 kb. The best sort of pack bio run I've ever seen so far, the average read length was about uh, approaching 20 kb. The very longest read was out at about 100 kb. We're seeing similar results with the Nanopore, uh, although the, the real, there are some su substantial challenges with the Nanopore, in particular in terms of throughput. Uh, to date, the best flow cell ever generated by anyone on the planet has been less than a gigabase of sequencing over several days whereas we get a gigabase of sequence on the PacBio in a couple hours. So there's, there's a sort of kind of orders of magnitude uh, differences in terms of the throughput such that, so for most of, the, most of the studies that we're interested in today, we're really focused on, on the PacBio instrument rather than the Nanopore. Although I'm certain this is gonna change over time as the Nanopore uh, improves its throughput. Uh, there's also a new instrument. I guess, I guess some of us have seen it at the New York Genome Center and locked away in one of the rooms. I've seen pictures of it on, tw on Twitter from, from this guy over here. So it does exist. I've never seen the data, though. So let me, so let me tell you a little bit about how the PacBio works, and we'll talk about some of the results we're seeing in a few different studies. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that at the end. Good question, though. Good question. Right, so the way that the PacBio instrument works, right, so it's a single molecule uh, sequencing instrument. At some level, it's not that dissimilar from Illumina sequencing, right? Both Illumina and PacBio are using an optical readout uh, of fluorescently tagged nucleotides. The, uh, the major distinction, though, is with the, with the, with the PacBio, we're going to be reading out individual fluorescent dyes uh, tagged on nucleotides as, as they're uh, being incorporated along the, along the template. So the way that it is, is it's a very big instrument, like literally weighs many tons. Part of the, this is all by design to, to just mechanically dampen any vibrations in the room because it's optical readouts of single molecules. So it's this huge instrument with this uh, 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 temperature controlled chamber in the middle that's gonna try to keep things very still. And then inside of this, we're gonna load in what's called a smart cell, which is like yay big. We load the smart cell. On the smart cell, there's uh, 150,000 what are called zero mode waveguides. You can think of these as like teeny tiny little reaction uh, wells, where at the bottom of the well, we're gonna anchor a polymerase, and this is what's gonna be dry generating the sequencing reaction. So it's an it's a, it started out as a natural polymerase, but now they've he heavily engineered it to, to, to give it new properties to make it sort of more robust. So there's a polymerase anchor at the bottom, the template molecule gets loaded in, there's sort of just free uh, fluorescently tagged nucleotides floating around in solution. Uh, the polymerase will incorporate, incorporate those. We're gonna shine a laser up through the bottom, and then what we hope is, is as the polymerase is incorporating these nucleotides, it'll glow you know, one color or another depending on the, on, the, on the nucleotide that was being incorporated. So here, you know, the raw signal is actually this movie where it starts you know, some baseline. It'll jump up into one color as it's being incorporated, back down to baseline, jump up in another co color, back down to baseline, and so forth. That's, that's, how, that's how it works. Now, the, 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 the sort of the critical sort of issue with uh, both the PacBio instrument and the Nanopore is that the, the, because they're doing single molecule analysis, we're trying to like, you know, measure 
optical signal from you know, individual uh, molecules. In the case of the nanopore, we're trying to measure electrical signal as, it's, as individual uh, molecules are passing through a pore. It's just, it's just inherently very a noisy process. So that the raw data that we get off the instrument is, is, is very large. We're going to you know, get these reads that are 1,000 times longer than aluminum sequencing. But they're very, very fuzzy in some sense. There's gonna be, they're going to be filled with lots of sort of mistakes along the way. Uh, the good news for this, though, is, is over the last several years, we've developed a number, myself, my lab, other labs around the world, PacBio, uh, Oxford Nanopore, have developed a series of algorithms. Where we're going to start with you know, some of this fuzzy picture. And then much like in Photoshop, how there's the sharpen button, we're going to try to add the sharpen button, take these fuzzy, big fuzzy images, sharpen them up so that we can actually see what's present there. The, the reason that this, this works, in the case, especially in the case of PacBio, is that the, the, as far as we can tell, the error model is dominated by uh, uh, a random, basically phantom insertion of extraneous bases uh, that are picked up by the, by the lasers. So the idea is, if we go back a couple of slides, you know, what we hope is, is that we're going to get signal from the fleshly tagged nucleotide that is being incorporated uh, along the template. But occasionally, there'll just be a nucleotide that floats in there. We'll shine a laser on it. We'll get a readout from it, but it's not actually being incorporated on the template so that for the, for the PacBio, the, the error model is dominated by about 12% of these phantom you know, false bases along the way. The good news, though, in, a, in, a, in both a theoretical sense and in a very practical sense, if we can take enough of these you know, very long but a little bit fuzzy reads and we can stack them up on top of each other, and we can look at it, we can ask the question, well, what is the sort of the quality of the consensus of all of this? The good news is, is in, is that the error rate, given enough coverage, effectively goes to zero. Right? There's, this, there's, this, there's a simple sort of binomial model that explains this. But the idea is, as you get more and more coverage stacked up, it is incredibly unlikely to see the same random phantom base over and over and over again, so that the signal that we have you know, in enough, with enough reads will dominate, uh, will dominate in any particular column of the multiple alignment. And then suddenly, the error rate you know, pretty much effectively goes to zero. So a lot of, especially in the early days, before we had any algorithms that could, that could deal with this, it was very frustrating and challenging to work with these data. But now that we have a bunch of algorithms that are available, you know, don't, don't worry so much about the raw error rate. You know, we, have, we have some strategies uh, to work with this. The, the sort of the choice of which strategy to use uh, entirely depends on how much coverage you have available. At, at the very high end, if you have, say, more than 50x coverage, you can do what I just described. We're going to take these very long reads. We're going to align them to other long but sort of fuzzy reads. We're going to build a pile up of how those sequences relate to each other, do some error correction from that. Uh, once we have long you know, error corrected reads with, you know, there's, there's, there's often a little bit of residual error, you know, less than a percent. Once we have long error corrected reads, we can just assemble them uh, and then get some really high quality assemblies, as you'll see in, in, a, in a second. If you have uh, uh, sort of less coverage than that, you know, around 50x coverage tends to be about the right uh, cutoff. Then we're going to apply a variety of different hybrid strategies. We're going to combine these long packed bio reads with Illumina sequencing, other sequencing that is more sort of affordable, more abundant. This kind of goes back to the cost question. Uh, but conceptually, it's the same idea. We take one of these long reads. We're going to map onto it in a very sensitive way uh, many, many of these uh, uh, high quality Illumina sequences. Uh, there's some nice um, uh, algorithms involved there uh, because you're going to get a mixture of true alignments that you actually want to use. And then you're going to get a mixture of just sort of uh, uh, repetitive alignments that you're not so inter inter interested in. So you have to do some scoring of the alignments, pick out the alignments that you want, do some error correction, get some nice long reads. At the low end, and here I mean like you know, less than 5x coverage or so, it's not really effective to do a de novo assembly with just 5x coverage or less, just because of uh, the statistics of, uh, of the Poisson sequencing. Uh, so in, uh, a good strategy for that is there's a nice uh, package from the Beller College of Medicine called PB Jelly. And the idea there is if you already have a, a pretty good assembly from, say, Illumina, where you already have contigs and scaffolds, where you know, you know approximately how far apart these, these contigs should be, but there's some ambiguity, there's some ends in between there, let's use these long uh, reads to try to patch in some of those gaps. In our hands, that's been very effective. Uh, it, it basically takes scaffolds of you know, whatever quality that you have to start and then turns those more or less into contigs. So that's, that's a nice improvement uh, using relatively low amounts of sequencing data. So like I mentioned, so we've been, we've been using this instrument for a number of years. Uh, uh, I've been involved in, uh, I, 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 I kind of lost track, honestly. It's, it's more, I don't know, more than a dozen different projects uh, across the tree of life. So here I have you know, a picture of E. coli. Here I have uh, Saccharomyces pombe. Here I have Asian sea bass. Here I have uh, uh, rice. And then at the top here I have 
uh, human genomes, all of which we've been sequencing, we've been studying with PacBio. Again, this is just a small subset of all the projects that we've been going on. On the left here, I have kind of a typical uh, relink distribution. This actually came from the Rice project. Here we had you know, this nice sort of elbow to the distribution where the average relink was about 15 KB long tail distribution moving out. As a result of this, using different sort of assembly strategies, we've been able to do error correction in all these projects. We've been able to make assemblies in all these projects. Uh, just to kind of give you an overview of the types of qualities that we're getting, here I have the contig N50 sizes for each of these projects. So I got, I got started at, with, actually there's a few of us in the room, I got started at the Institute of Genomic Research uh, back in about 2000 when we were sequencing microbes and this was like a million dollar project to sequence one microbe and we were you know, excited by every base that we got. We were excited when we got contigs that were tens of KB. Now we're, now we're getting you know, uh, E. coli assembled into one contig with like you know, an afternoon's worth of sequencing. We're getting yeast assembled into basically one contig for every chromosome, again with an afternoon's worth of sequencing. Uh, the rice assembly that we have uh, rivals the $200 million rice sequencing project from a few years ago that was doing this very expensive back-by-back -back approach. In the case of animal projects like sea bass, we're getting like the world's best assemblies out of these. Even in the case of human, the assembly that we have today rivals in some ways the, the reference genome. The assembly that we have for human has been, has been uh, uh, carefully selected. It's not just an anonymous person. We were actually use, we were very interested to use this technology to, to study uh, 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 structural variations, and in particular, we were very interested to use this technology to study structural variations in cancer. So the cancer that we were uh, very interested in is a, uh, is a form of breast cancer called HER2 positive. Uh, HER2 is, is, a, is a receptor gene, and then if it's been amplified, this can have a very uh, negative um, uh, outcome for the, for, the, for the different patients. So if, for, so women that have uh, HER2 amplified breast cancers, uh, which, is, which makes about 20% of all breast cancers, they have a much greater risk of recurrence, they have a much greater risk for metastasis if it's not treated, and they also have kind of a, a much worse uh, survival probability if it's not treated. So it's a very uh, significant uh, form of breast cancer. It's very important to understand all the genetics, all the sort of molecular uh, uh, dynamics behind it. So in, the, the, the number one model used for studying HER2 breast, HER2 positive breast cancer is a cell line that was derived at Sloan Kettering in the 70s called SKBR3. Uh, it's, a, it's a highly rearranged uh, cell line. It's a, it's a very, very complicated human genome. In fact, it, it like barely uh, resembles human. So this is a, um, a spectral karyotyping that we, that we did not ge generate published in the year 2000. Of all the chromosomes painted, it should be painted a consistent color for each chromosome. What we see is that, you know, in addition to having sort of aneuploidy of having multiple copies of certain chromosomes, some of the, some of the chromosomes are, are like a Frankenstein. We're going to get huge segments of different regions all sort of concatenated together. It's just an incredibly complicated um, um, uh, genome. Uh, just, just to kind of point out, this will become very important later. It's hard, a little bit hard to see, but this is this is a this is a, a represent this is a picture of chromosome eight uh, stained, and notice you have many many you have much more than the sort of two copies that you expect. And again, it's this concatenation of different fragments of different chromosomes all pieced together. So we were very interested. You know, this is this is an ex exceedingly important uh, breast cancer. This is an exceedingly important uh, cell line. You know, could we study all the complex structural variations that are present, especially those around her tube? So to do so, we formed a collaboration between Cold Spring Harbor and the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research to try to, to, try to generate you know, very long sequencing data to be able to piece together uh, all of the complicated mutational history in this, in this genome. Oh, I should, before I go further, so this is, this, the, all the analysis, uh, almost all the analysis has been carried out by my uh, really uh, stellar student, Maria, uh, who unfortunately couldn't make it today. So the data that we so we've been, we started generating data for this project uh, just last November, so just uh, not too long ago. Uh, in the early days of the in the early days of the sequencing, a few months ago, <laughs> it's, it's, it's remarkable how fast the technology improves. Uh, this is the sort of relink distribution that we're seeing. We're getting about you know mean of about six KB, only a few hundred megabases per smart cell. Uh, but the sort of the, the the nice thing is is just in the last few months we've gotten much better at 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 at, at, at sort of generating high molecular weight libraries and getting much uh, more uh, uh, useful data out. So our, our mean read length is more or less doubled, uh, and, our, and notably our yield on the smart, per smart cell has gone up by a factor of five. And today we're, we're getting, uh, routinely getting smart cells that are giving us 
more than a gigabase of sequence. And again, this is like a two hour movie, so that we can get very rapidly generate a lot of sequence data. In terms of cost, each smart cell is about $200. So it's uh, not, uh, it's certainly more expensive than Illumina sequencing, but for certain projects, this can be in a really important uh, uh, advance. Uh, uh, well, we'll get there in a second. <clears throat> so in this sample, we have, uh, we've done a lot of sequencing. Uh, part, of, part of this is by design, we're gonna, go, we're gonna go deeper than we know we really need to so that we can then downsample and ask the question, well, what would have been the minimum, this goes to your question, what would have been the minimum coverage requirements to capture the features that we see? So here we've generated a bit over 70x coverage total. This, uh, admittedly, this was a lot of smart cells between uh, basically running the instrument at Cold Spring Harbor and at Ontario, you know, uh, not quite full time, but about half time for a few months. So it's been a, it's been a big project to do this. The remarkable thing, though, is nevertheless, we've generated just shy of 50x coverage of reads over 10,000 base pairs. This is, again, this is, this is sort of mind-blowing to me, having been in genomics for some time. And then even more mind-blowing is we have over 10x coverage in reads over 20,000 base pairs, right? So whereas Illumina, we kind of uh, you know, get really excited when we get our you know, 2 by 250s now we're throwing away every read less than 10,000 base pairs, because it adds more noise and, than value to the project. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable. Uh, in this project, the max you know, read was about 71,000 base pairs, but we got you know, one of those. So let's not get too excited about you know, longest reads. But we're, you know, it's always nice to see this distribution shift. In some of the later, uh, actually in, in some of the most recent data I've seen, this sort of hump has been shifted over more towards 30 KB. So we're, we're still continuing to improve on the technology, getting better and better at using it to study these genomes. So what I have here, this is, a, this is, this is kind of an unusual plot, so let me sort of walk through what this is. This is called a violin plot, and what I've done here is, so we've taken this data, we've mapped it to the, to the reference human genome, and what I'm plotting here is the distribution on coverage across every chromosome. So each one of these you can think of as like a little, as a histogram of, of how much coverage that we observe on chromosome X, 22, 21, 20, so forth. This is not saying, you know, that, you know, that the, I don't know, P arm has more coverage than the Q arm. This is just a distribution you know, as we summarize all the data across each of these um, chromosomes. So altogether, you know, after we've thrown away short reads and we've aligned the data back to the genome, we have about 54x uh, full coverage across the genome. It's, but, it, but again, because the cell line is so complicated where there's so much aneuploidy, uh, there's actually a different mean coverage per chromosome depending on how many copies of the molecules are in the original uh, sample that we're sequencing. And then some of these uh, chromosomes are, are look bimodal, where you have like one entire chromosome arm that's been duplicated, so you get you know double coverage of it. In particular, we're going to focus in on here at chromosome 17. This is where the gene that encodes for HER2 lives. So we're going to we're going to study that in more detail. So this is a plot of the coverage that we see across the, all of chromosome 17, all 83 megabases that are there. HER2 more or less centered in the middle. If we're going to zoom in on just the sort of the eight or so megabases surrounding uh, HER2, we see a, a, a really funny pattern like this. So when we first saw this, we we're like, oh no, you know, something horrible went wrong with the library preparation. You know, why do we see this funny uh, coverage plot here? Uh, so then we compared it to uh, the Illumina sequencing that we had of the same cell line. This is about 100x, uh, a little bit of 120x coverage of about 100 base pair reads. We were, we were sort of pleased to see that they're highly correlated, that you know, in both technologies, from the, both, from the same cell line, we're seeing the same sort of pileup of coverage there. Uh, and what we believe this to be is just this one region has been hi highly amplified. Actually, this has been known from, from previous studies, so we actually weren't that worried when we saw this. If you squint carefully at this, you'll notice, yes, they're highly correlated, but they're not exactly the, the same. There's regions from the Illumina coverage where we get this like weird dropouts. We were really, really, we were really interested as to what, you know, what was driving behind that. So we also, at the bottom here, we have a plot of where, you know, sort of camera coverage in the reference human genome about trying to discover where the repeats are. And all those spots where you have weird Illumina dropouts are, are exactly where the, the genome is most complicated in terms of repeats. But because we were, you know, now we're looking at reads exclusively over 10,000 base pairs, you know, repetitive 21 mer is no problem whatsoever. We can just get more uniform coverage across there. So that, so that was you know, kind of reassuring, uh, number one, that we get from just this copy an analysis, we get a really good resolution of, of, this, of this particular HER2 region. Of course, though, what we're really interested in is, is looking at the structural variations and not only saying, you know, where are these copy number amplifications occurring, but how are the chromosomes all linked up to explain how this has happened? So there's a, there's a few different strategies from this. You know, all, again, all leveraging the fact that we have these super long reads where 
uh, we're going to be able to pretty successfully be able to, to, to jump from, say, one chromosome to the next, both in terms of doing something like split read analysis. So here are examples where I have you know, half of this read aligns the chromosome A, half this read aligns the chromosome B. We can readily detect that. Uh, other things we've been trying to do is once we get some signal for there being a, a, one of these breakpoints, we can then go in and grab just that set of reads, be able to do an a, a, a on-the-fly de novo assembly of just reads in that region. And the very new result that we have is given you know, the 70x coverage that we had all, all together, we've been able to run this through a, a really high performance uh, whole genome assembler called Falcon produced by PacBio. And this gave us a remarkably good assembly. So we assembled pretty much the whole genome. Uh, the, the contig N50 size, again, this is the sort of average contig length is about 2.5 megabases. We were able to, fully, we were able to successfully assemble uh, the biggest contig was about 23 uh, megabases. I think this is an incredibly stellar result. A lot of the reason why we have, uh, you know, we get these big megabase contigs, when we look at the ends of these contigs, they almost always end at these structural variations. So we, you know, we're able to, um, we're able to, you know, get right up to the boundary. Oftentimes, we're able to to jump across them. Uh, although, in, you know, in very complicated structural variations, the assembly, the reads we have are not yet quite long enough to fully resolve them. But we're we're making a lot of progress uh, along this way. So again, looking at sort of the sort of pack bio coverage, Illumina coverage, we're, we've been able to use a, a variety of different techniques to look for structural variations along the way. In particular, we were using a combination of BWA-MEM. This is one of these you know, nice uh, mappers that can successfully align these very long reads. And then we are using a, a nice program called Lumpy from Aaron Quinlan's lab to look at uh, candidate breakpoints. So this is, the, this is the set of candidate breakpoints that were reported by Lumpy. There was also this very complicated inverted duplication that we were able to pick out from the BWA-MEM alignments. The numbers here tell us, well, how many reads of the pac bio reads were supporting this breakpoint. So they're all very high confident. Uh, many of these have been uh, reported in the literature before. We're going to go back and do a PCR validation, basically, of all of these. That's ongoing. In contrast, when we, when we do the, sort of the same thing from the Illumina sequencing data, we get some of these breakpoints picked up, uh, but we're also missing, you know, we're also missing what should clearly be some breakpoints. Uh, when we go, again, when we go and we look at the sequences that are there, uh, a lot of these breakpoints are occurring in very simple repeats. So this would be like a 20 mer or 30 mer that's a microsatellite, so it'll be like AAA or ACAC, ACAC, ACAC. Uh, and because the reads are only 100 base pairs long, it's very hard to align in those regions, so you just get, you just get failure to map there, so it's no surprise at all that we're not going to be able to pick up uh, breakpoints from that. In addition, we get sort of phantom breakpoints. When we go in and we look at those regions, it's, just, it's, it's the same problem. That there's some repetitive sequence there where it looks like the Illumina sequences have been misplaced, so you get these phantom false positives as well. So not only do we see sort of breakpoints, the nice thing is because these reads are so long, we can, we can actually like very confidently tie together uh, distant chromosomes. And, and, and interestingly, in this region, so this is on chromosome 17 at the top, interestingly, all of the sort of, all of the analysis says all of the breakpoints jump into chromosome 8. If you remember the karyotype from the beginning, chromosome 8 was that one that was this hydra where it was many copies of the, of, the, of the chromosome and lots of concatenations there. So it's kind of, in some sense, it's no surprise that we saw every single one of them jump into eight. So following the split read mappings, we can connect from one chromosome to the next. There's a whole, you know, again, this is a highly complicated uh, cell line. It's very complicated here. Here where we pointed out one of the, one of the gene, known gene fusions that we're able to very easily read off from this graph. Here's another one of these uh, gene fusions that we're able to read off from this graph. In fact, as we, as we kind of zoom in on individual regions, so I'm going to zoom in on this first one, not only are we able to get sort of breakpoints, we can now very confidently say, oh, well, it's, you know, from chromosome 17, it jumped into this region of chromosome 8. There's no other breakpoints there. We have sort of nice coverage distribution, jumps back into chromosome uh, 17. So we can do this. We can, we're, not, we're not just seeing breakpoints. We're actually starting to see the underlying events. So now, we're, now that we can sort of see these underlying events, we can start to really uh, do some inference as to what happened to this genome, what made it so complicated. So here's, here's what, you know, given today, this is what we think would happen. So starting out, there was a, you know, sort of healthy diploid genome in this, in this woman. And then something happened, something catastrophic happened, where there, you know, it just started triggering this cascade of structural variations nested inside of each other. So we think, so this is one of these arguments from parsimony, the thing that, that is most likely to have occurred first was there was this large-scale translocation of this, this large a uh, couple megabase region from chromosome 17 into chromosome 8. 
Uh, and then inside of chromosome 8, we see there are a series of additional uh, 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 structural variations. So here is a segment that was duplicated, but there's this complicated tandem duplication that we can finally resolve. We see you know, evidence for all that. And then finally, there was another fragment of this that was then later amplified through a series of additional duplications, all again, all inside of chromosome 8. So, so for whatever reason, chromosome 8 has been this hotbed of instability generating uh, this, this whole composite series of, of amplifications. So that's so we're very excited about this result. I think this is I think this is a testament to the power of of, of these super long reads is that you know we'll be able to observe mutations and then go back and then do some inference as to saying you know what 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 happened here be able to tell a really nice story about this. So that was the result and, and just her too. This was the you know this is the reason for studying the cell line. Uh, we've also been going looking at all the other sort of important oncogenes. There's been some known sort of missense mutations in p53 that we're able to recover. We're able to observe amplifications and other important oncogenes. We're able to pick out uh, uh, basically all the known gene fusions uh, uh, quite readily. So all these, all these data that I just described are available today. We're doing something very risky. We're releasing all the data pre-publication. You can go to my website. You can go download uh, all the you know, FASTQ files, BAM files. There's an interactive coverage plot you can go play with. The whole genome assembly is available today. We just think this is just so important for breast cancer research. We just want to get it out there. We are asking that you, you know, sort of respect the Toronto Agreement. You know, please look at it, but give us you know, a little bit of time to, to submit the paper describing it. The things that will be available soon, because this is, this is, single, this is single molecule sequencing, we're, we're, we're basically watching the kinetics of the polymerase. You also get a very strong readout about methylation status, because that'll make the polymerase stutter or accelerate a little bit. Uh, we, I don't, I don't, it's in the interest of time, I'm not going to present the results today, but we also have really, you know, really nice uh, sort of differential methylation analysis, and this is just not methyl C. This can be other, um, um, uh, other uh, epigenetic modifications in there as well. We also are generating full-length cDNA data, gamma pack bio. They have a protocol called ISOSeq where you give it cDNAs, and you just basically get full-length transcripts. This will let us confirm a lot of the known gene fusions, hopefully discover many more of those data will be available in the next uh, two weeks or so. And then from this same cell line, we've also uh, done some analysis. We've also uh, done sequencing of individual uh, cells to be able to look at in sort of the population in the cell line, what sort of mutations that we see. That'll be kind of my segue to part two of this talk. So today there's, there's no paper available on this project yet. So that's, that's what we're actively working on right now. If you're interested in kind of the future of long read assembly, uh, Looking at you know the available technologies today, looking into the future as the technologies to get to get better. We did a nice study. So Hyan in the second row here, she's one of my uh, star graduate students. She'll be graduating soon. So if you're shopping around for awesome postdoc, please talk to her at the break. Uh, we put together sort of a, a sort of a review of the state of the art in the in you know available technologies moving forward. We're in the process of, of updating this. So come talk to us if you're interested in this. We'll tell you about all the all the new uh, results. Okay, so that was, that was part one of, of my presentation today, talking about sort of long, particular long read single molecule sequencing. Again, I, 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 again, I, I didn't say too much about the nanopore. Again, if people are interested, we can talk about that at the break. Uh, the main, again, the main challenge there is just the throughput so that we're stuck sequencing microbes in, in the short term. So part two of my talk, we're going to go, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the copy no, single cell copy number analysis we're doing. Again, also primarily focusing on cancer. Uh, and again, this is, cancer is a nice uh, test environment because there's so much variability that uh, there'll be interesting patterns to see there. So as I'm sure everyone in the room is aware of, you know, there's, there's been a lot of uh, um, um, uh, research recently into, into single cell analysis for a variety of different projects. We're going to hear about many of these as well later today. So I'm gonna, I'm, today, though, I'm going to focus primarily on single cell copy number analysis. So this is going to be strictly looking at sort of genomic DNA inside of single cells. We'll hear a lot about some of the other projects from Dana and Viv. I lost them up here. We'll hear about a lot about you know looking at RNA, looking at other properties uh, later on today. So so just, this will just hopefully set up the stage for this. Uh, so even at the level of genomic um, sequencing, there's a lot of variability that people can be interested in. So this can be things like looking at germ cells. We're going to look at how you know rates of recombinations. You know if there's any sort of hotspots, things like this. There's been some uh, early reports. I think the jury's still out as to the significance of these reports. But there's been uh, reports of very widespread of copy number variation in neurons, in healthy people even. So there's in a recent science paper, 
claiming that 30% of all neurons had some major um, you know, megabase regions were either amplified or deleted inside of healthy neurons. Uh, I, at Cold Spring Harbor, we've been primarily focusing on, on, on applications to cancer, so things like looking for circulating tumor cells, just you know, sort of floating around in your bloodstream. Can we identify them? Can we sequence them? Can we use this as an early biomarker to be able to, to sort of early uh, detection and potentially you know, uh, personalization of any sort of treatments along the way? And then finally, a, a really nice example of why this is a powerful approach has been looking at sort of evolution inside of tumors. We're going to get you know, potentially you're going to get this whole uh, population of different cells growing that all can have, in theory, you know, distinct, unique makeups. What we're observing, though, is, is that you're going to get, uh, you know, from, presumably from some original, uh, you know, mother cell, you're going to see a few major subclones, and then we can be able to go in and study those in great detail, and also their metastases. A great example of this work, this predates me being at Cold Spring Harbor, but a few years ago there was this really nice paper from the Wiggler Lab at Cold Spring Harbor where they had taken a, this is a, this is a tumor from a breast cancer. They had, they had uh, um, uh, cut it into different sectors, and then from each sector, they pulled out a certain number of cells. I think it was around 12 cells per these six uh, sectors. Uh, then in each of these cells, they did copy number analysis, you know, genome-wide in each of these cells. Uh, this, from, that, from that information, you can build up a tree about how all those cells relate to each other. In this case, there, you know, kind of observation number one was there was a lot of variability in these cells so that you could pull out you know, v radically different uh, subclones inside of there. A lot of, the, a lot of the tissue from the tumor actually turned out to be basically healthy, normal diploid uh, uh, cells in there, but then you had combinations with progressively more and more uh, amplifications uh, uh, and so forth. So it's, it's a really nice way to be able to, to study these data. And that really motivated us to, to build, at the time that this was put together, it was, it was a very, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a pioneering project. There was no literature that they could build on. There was no algorithms available. So now we're trying to go back, build some algorithms to make this sort of, this type of analysis is a lot more robust, a lot more automated. And I'll describe some of the algorithms available for that today. So there's, uh, so just to kind of, bring everyone up to speed as to what this sort of analysis looks like. So we're going to be looking at copy number changes along the genome. This is not like a SNP analysis. We're going to be looking at you know, relatively large scale copy numbers. So in the case of just like a normal, healthy, you know, diploid sample, what I have is, you know, there's going to be two copies of the chromosome. So what I have pointed, what I have plotted here is some measurement of copy number state. So the x-axis is like 0, 1, 2, 3, so forth. And then along uh, each of those points represents a different sort of region of the genome. I have it painted in alternating colors by the chromosome. So that first segment in blue is chromosome 1, and chromosome 2, 3, 4, so forth. And then down here we have x, y. So result number 1, the very last bins are all 0. So uh, uh, it's a male, excuse me, it's a female because there's no y chromosome. Uh, so this would be just like a healthy person, you know, diploid status of all the chromosomes. If we got some sort of uh, deletion, so this so it'll be, you know, that segment gets deleted out. So now we're going to have uh, across the genome, some of the, say, chromosomes will have losses. We're going to have a, a shift down in this sort of analysis plot. And then, and then sort of uh, conversely, if we have any sort of amplifications, we're going to see it jump up from baseline uh, copy number two up to three, four, five, and so forth. So that's going to be the type of data that we want to get to, although the instruments you know, don't actually make these plots. We have to, we have to uh, develop a lot of software to get there. Okay, so to do so, uh, we, also, we also have to develop some new biotechnologies, right? So the common, say, Illumina sequencing, the input requirements for this are often measured in, like, nanograms. Uh, in the case of the PAC bio, I tease a little bit, uh, often measured in, like, kilograms of DNA. It's like, you know, a little bit of a challenge there, teasing a little bit. Uh, but, of course, inside of an individual cell, we're talking about, like, picograms of DNA. So the way that, that most uh, sequencing is done is we're going to take cells, you know, on the order of, say, millions of cells, collect the DNA out of all of them, uh, get loads of DNA. This is, this is often called bulk sequence analysis, run it through instrument. That, you know, that's what we're all doing for most projects. That's what we're all doing. It works extremely well. We're going to get a nice readout. The problem, though, is that if there's any sort of, you know, composition to these cells, you know, in the case of, say, tumors, where there's going to be gains and losses of different chromosomes, all of that signal is going to get mixed together when we have these loads of DNA, right? We're going to, we're going to, we're going to lose track of who's related to who. Uh, there's been a lot of great work in to try and, you know, from this mixed signal, can we infer, you know, the different major subclones by looking at, you know, 
patterns of SNPs, frequencies, things like this. But it's, it's a very challenging problem. I think at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's an inference. At the end of the day, you're going to hit this inference limit where if you don't have you know, den enough density in the marker, you're just going to be lost. You're not going to be able to, to really say uh, conclusively, in this cell there was this, in this cell there was that, so forth. So that requires some new biotechnology in order to you know, keep the instruments, make them effective. Um, and the way we're going to do this is through a variety of single cell approaches using something called whole genome amplification. So in some way, we're going to be able to isolate a cell. Either we're going to you know, you know, full physically cut it out, pull it out, or we're going to put it in solution and then do some flow sort. And in any number of ways, we're going to be able to isolate individual cells. From there, we can you know, lyse them. We can extract the DNA. This will be in the order of picograms. And then using one of these whole, whole genome amplification approaches get us back to the point where we have you know, nanograms of DNA sufficient to be able to run it through the analysis system. Now, the, the, there's a few different strategies for doing this amplification. At the end of the day, they're all using something like PCR to generate extra copies of DNA, because that's like the one thing that we know how to do really well. There's been some uh, different strategies uh, uh, in terms of how the, when in terms of what barcodes are added on or how we're going to control these reactions to try to limit, um, the, the, uh, limit some of the biases that we see in the data. If you're interested in sort of looking, you know, learning more about these particular uh, biochemical techniques, I encourage you to check out a recent paper, preprint paper, where we describe these approaches and we measure some of their biases. They all have, they're all biased, right? None of, even though they're all called whole genome amplification, none of them actually amplify the whole genome, you know, perfectly uniform. They all have different biases. Uh, so in this paper, we've gone in and tried to measure different biases with respect to sort of uniformity of coverage, GC content. Uh, ability to resolve copy number variations, all these different things. So I encourage you to check it out. Because this is kind of an algorithmic seminar, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zip ahead and describe some of the analysis that we do with these data once it has been amplified. So again, the, you know, from, because these data you know, are starting you know, infinitesimally small uh, collections of DNA amplified up, do some sequencing analysis of this, the data are just very, very noisy, right? So we've, we've, we've started from an individual cell where we think there's actually an integer quantile number of chromosomes, right? There should be like one copy of chromosome two or two copies or three copies, you know. There could be some variability wrong there, but it doesn't make sense to have like, you know, in this region, 1.3 copies of this region of the chromosome. That doesn't, just doesn't make sense when you think about the underlying physics, right? We're, we're looking at integer copy uh, molecules. But the issue is, is because we're doing all this sampling, there's all these bar artifacts, the data that we get as a raw signal are very noisy. And the, and the sources of noise are, are at every step, right? So the, the amplification is just not going to be uniform. It's going to be really sparse. It's going to give us uh, uh, sort of weird results there sometimes. In the library preparation, you know, if we're not careful, it could be really low complexity DNA. And then as we're going to add on barcodes and anything, the PCR can jackpot. So we're just going to get uneven uh, preparation or li uh, library preparation can lead to massive reduplications that we see in some of the projects that so just distort the analysis uh, tremendously. In terms of the sequencing, at the end of the day, so for this work, we're going to be leveraging the Illumina sequencing, which suffers massively from GC artifacts when we're talking about amplified DNA. Uh, and also the reads are going to be, they're going to generate are going to be very short, limiting our power to then go map it in there. And then in terms of computation, we have, to, we, have to, we have to do copy number analysis, that's, you know, like we would for bulk sequencing, which is, which is hard. But then we have to really carefully account for all these different issues uh, in terms of single cell analysis. Uh, I, sh I, should have just, I should have said this earlier. When we do these projects, you know, we're not going to sequence to 30 or 50x coverage of the genome. Typically, these are done to a fraction of an x coverage. So we're going to get like, you know, genome wide, we're going to get like 0.1x coverage of the genome or 0.2x coverage of the genome. Uh, remarkably, though, even at that low amount of sequencing, we are going to get robust copy number assignments if we use the right uh, amplification techniques. So the coverage is going to be way too sparse to do, you know, SNP analysis reliably. Sorry, Chris, I know you're trying to do this, uh, but we are, you know, we are going to be able to get uh, copy number analysis, but it's going to require very specialized uh, processing. So the first thing that we're going to do is just to sort of combat the noise and sort of sort of aggregate some of this weak signal into a stronger signal. Is we're going to have to define some binning across the genome. So what I've done here is this is my sort of cartoon version where I've taken the genome. And, I, and conceptually, what I do is I want to break it up into different bins. The size of the bins are going to be entirely determined by how much sequence data you have, aka how much money are you willing to spend on this project. Right, so what we want to achieve is something like on the order of 100 reads per bin. So if you've done, uh, I don't know, 
100, uh, 100 million reads, well then you can split up the genome into a million bins, that's expensive though. If you've done something like, I don't know, a million reads, then you can split it up into 10,000 bins. Now the, the one sort of major trick for this though is, is we're not just gonna just sort of arbitrarily chop off, I don't know, 10,000 bases, then the next 10,000 bases, the next 1,000 bases. And that's because as you look across entire chromosomes, you know, not every base inside of any region is gonna be equally, uh, equally mappable, right? At, at, in the extreme limit, especially near the centromere, there's often these runs of like N, 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 N. In terms of the copy number analysis that we might do, none of our reads are gonna map when it's all Ns, so we're just gonna get no signal. So if you're not careful, you're gonna be like, oh, there's this deletion of the centromere, but this is just you know, a technical artifact. Even in less extreme cases where you have just repetitive elements scattered throughout there, this is gonna confuse the mapper, uh, so we gotta account for this. If you're interested in you know, more precisely how to do this, Tyler Garvin led this project. He's sitting over here. He can, he can talk to you at the break exactly how this is done. So once we have our bins, we can just start mapping reads. I'm just gonna show this as, as dots to emphasize the fact we're, we're not actually gonna learn anything about the sequence per se. We're just using these sequences as little tags that we can put in these different bins just to sort of organize our, 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 our coverage that is coming from there. And then the idea is if we do this enough times, you know, we're gonna get this nice sampling of the molecules. We, hopefully we're gonna get this nice sampling uh, across the genome about how many copies of each molecule that are gonna be there. Now, of course, we're not gonna get, you know, oh, there were two molecules here. We're gonna get just sort of count data. We can turn this then into a vector, you know, at each bin across the genome. We can say, oh, well, how many reads do we see there? This is actually gonna become sort of the input to our copy number inference algorithms. So that was just sort of a cartoon example. This is a real cell where we've just counted how many reads in this, in the, uh, uh, fall in each bin. In this case, we had uh, uh, 60, you know, 65,000 odd bins or so. Uh, so here we had on the order of a few million reads that we were trying to do this analysis for. So the raw signal is just going to, we're just going to have bin count, how many, how many reads are in each bin. Uh, to make this sort of normalized in case there's any variability in how many reads you have per cell, sort of the next thing to do is just trivial division. We're going to recenter this at a mean of one. Along the way, as we do this normalization, we're also going to do things like correct for mappability, correct for GC con content, correct for amplification biases, try to sort of clean up the signal as much as possible. And then what we hope is that, you know, from this signal, what we hope is that, you know, what this should say is this part of the chromosome is, should be at an at a integer copy number state. This part of the chromosome should be at an integer copy number state. So what we need to do next is try to segment it and try to find the regions that are at the, the consistent copy number state. So to do this, uh, we're going to basically try to find some sort of uh, average of, of these localized regions. To do so, we're going to use a technique called circular binary segmentation. Basically, it's, going to, it's a recursive algorithm. It's going to march across the genome, trying all possible breakpoints. And the idea is it's going to look for breakpoints where the, the, sort of the, the copy number state of the bins inside, of the, uh, inside the three different regions all have more or less consistent uh, copy number states. So once we defined, you know, we've cut out one segment that is weird with respect to the other regions, then we can recurse inside there, find another region that we can go segment that is sort of weird from the other ones and then recurse and do all, all of these until eventually we'll hopefully segment the entire genome. Uh, kind of the next step is now we have this sort of uh, read depth segmented. Now what we want to do is want to take all these segments and then find some sort of way to, to match them to integer copy number states. We're going to do this through uh, an optimization technique, uh, just a simple sort of numerical analysis. We're, we're going to try many, many different sort of linear scaling factors until we find the best one that's going to put these segments onto some integer lines. Then we just do a little bit of rounding, and then hopefully we're going to have, oh, across the genome, here's going to be the copy number state for this cell. Again, this is a complicated you know, cancer cell. If it was a healthy uh, diploid tissue, what we want to see is just you know, across copy number two. That's what we see in, in those types of cells. And then the last part of the algorithm is now, now we can do you know, collect data from one cell, map it out into its profile. Uh, from a second cell, map it to its profile, third cell, fourth cell, so forth. Eventually, you know, all these cells are going to be segmented. They're going to basically going to be vectors of copy number state or vectors of depth. We can then do, apply various algorithms to either do hierarchical clustering or we can do some sort of neighbor joining um, tree building techniques to be able to look at the, the population structure. In this case, we were sequencing not only from the primary tumor but from a metastasis. And what we found was that the metastasis most closely resembled a subpopulation inside, the, inside of the primary tumor. So it was, it was like pretty very clear connection about how the disease was, was progressing. So it's a complicated algorithm. There's many steps along the way, but we've, we've bundled this all together into a really nice, what well, we hope, really nice portal to make this as easy as possible to do so. Again, Tyler was the, 
lead on this. Uh, you can talk to him at the break if you want to see how to use it. We're very open to collaboration. We've been using this basically at every project at Cold Spring Harbor for any sort of single cell analysis and now branching out to many different uh, research groups. I think a few of you in the room may be using it today. In the, in the paper, we also compare you know, the different whole genome amplification techniques if you're interested to look at, understand some of those biases. We're very interested in collaboration, so if you're interested in these data or have these data, please come find us. We can try to help you uh, do the analysis or customize it how you may need. So the preprint describing this is available uh, at the bioarchive. And then just sort of one final technical thought in the last 20 seconds. You know, it's, it's very clear what's happening in the field. You know, now that the technologies are maturing for studying, say, you know, one genome or uh, even one cell, the, I think the next frontier in genomics is going to be is going to be sequencing, understanding, and, and sort of modeling entire populations. Just sort of just to put it on everyone's map, I've been I've been thinking about this both in a very theoretical and practical sense. In a theoretical sense, we've developed some algorithms that can build up graphs of populations of genomes to sort of you know look at how those sequences relate to each other. In a more practical sense, I encourage you to check out this position piece that we wrote with Deanna Church, now personnelist, formerly at NCBI, talking about all the needs in the, in, the, in the field to be able to look at these large collections and do sort of really uh, detailed analysis of them. So just to sort of summarize, we have some really powerful technologies uh, today, basically getting perfect microbial genomes, perfect small eukaryotic genomes, really high quality reference quality genomes for eukaryotes. And the level of single cell analysis, as you heard from my talk, we're going to be looking at the composition of complex environments in terms of their DNA. Some of the later talks, we're going to hear about uh, the, their, the composition of complex environments in terms of their molecular activities. These advances are just giving us incredible power to study how genomes mutate and evolve. I'm very, it's like, in my mind, this is the most exciting era ever to be in genomics, right? We have all this amazing technology. We can finally go make sense of all these different systems. And now we're really just limited by our sort of quantitative and computational power to make sense of all these comparisons and find all these patterns. So with that, I have a lot of people to thank. I have, I've, I've, I've really won the science lottery. Everyone my, everyone, every single person in my lab is a star. I, I really can't say enough about them. They're uh, really an outstanding group to work with. Uh, I, 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 it's really been a pleasure. Uh, a whole series of, of, of tremendous collaborations at Cold Spring Harbor, different groups there. Uh, great work with uh, Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, particularly with the PacBio breast cancer sequencing. A lot of collaborations with other people uh, looking, developing algorithms to do uh, uh, a long read assembly. The funding from this has been incredibly generous. I think uh, all the different major funding agencies, in particular the Simons Foundation, um, uh, for the research support that you've given me in the, in the last few years. So with that, I will thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, also, feel free to tweet. I'll post the slides online so we can talk about them later as well. Thank you very much, everyone.